My name is John Passfield, and I'm going to read a short segment from my novel, Pauline Johnson, Know Who I Am, uh, and the opening passage from a short story that Pauline Johnson wrote about her family. The book that I'm going to read from is this one, Pauline Johnson, Her Life and Work by Marcus Van Steen. It's a collection, uh, it's a short biography, but it's also a collection of prose and poems by Pauline Johnson. The passage from my novel that refers to the short story is this. It's on page 20. The main character, Pauline Johnson, is thinking, I have an idea for a story. Why didn't I think of it before? I've known this story since childhood. It's in the marrow of my bones. The story of my mother and my father. Exactly as it happened. Exactly as it was. It's a very powerful story. All the joy and all the pain. Word for word. Just as my mother told it to me. Now I'll only read the first few pages of a story about 50 pages hoping that you, the viewer of this video, will be moved to read the rest. So it's on page uh, 177 of this book, as I mentioned, Pauline Johnson, Her Life and Work. So the title as printed is, is My Mother, The Story of a Life of Unusual Experiences, Part 1. It was a very lonely little girl that stood on the deck of a huge sailing vessel, while the shores of England slipped down into the horizon and the great gray Atlantic yawned desolately westward. She was leaving so much behind her, taking so little with her, for the child was grave and old, even at the age of eight, and realized that this day meant the updragging of all the tiny roots that clung to the home soil of the older land. Her father was taking his wife and family, his household goods, his fortune and his future to America, which in the days of 1829 was indeed a venturesome step for America was regarded as remote as the North Pole. And goodbyes were, alas, very real goodbyes when travelers set sail for the new world in those times before steam and telegraph brought the two continents hand, almost touching hand. So, little Lydia Bessman stood drearily watching with sorrow-filled eyes the England of her babyhood fade slowly into the distance, eyes that were fated never to see again the royal old land of her birth. Already the deepest grief that life could hold had touched her young heart. She had lost her own gentle London-bred mother when she was but two. Whoops. Sorry, missed the page here. When she was but two years old, her father had married again, and on her sixth birthday, little Lydia, the youngest of a large family, had been sent away to boarding school with an elder sister, and her home knew her no more. She was taken from school to the sailing ship. Little stepbrothers and sisters had arrived, and she was no longer the baby. Years afterwards, she told her own little children that her one vivid recollection of England was the exquisite music of the church chimes as the ship weighed anchor in Bristol Harbor, chimes that were ringing for evensong from the towers of the quaint old English churches. Thirteen weeks later, that sailing vessel entered New York Harbor, and life in the New World began. Like most transplanted Englishmen, Mr. Bestman cut himself completely off from the England of his fathers. His interests and his friends henceforth were all in the country of his adoption, and he chose Ohio as the site for his new home. He was a man of vast peculiarities, prejudices, and extreme ideas, a man of contradictions so glaring that even his own children never understood him. 
He was a very narrow religionist of the type that say many prayers and quote much scripture, but he beat his children, both girls and boys, so severely that outsiders were at times compelled to interfere. For years, these unfortunate children carried the scars left on their backs by the thongs of cat o nine tails when he punished them for some slight misdemeanor. They were all terrified at him, all obeyed him like soldiers, but none escaped his severity. The two elder ones, a boy and a girl, had married before they left England. The next girl married in Ohio, and the boys drifted away, glad to escape from a parental tyranny that made home anything but a desirable abiding place. Finally, but two remained of the first family, Lydia and her sister Elizabeth, a most lovable girl of 17 whose beauty of character and self-sacrificing heart made the one bright memory that remained with their scattered fledglings throughout their entire lives. The lady who occupied the undesirable position of stepmother to these unfortunate children was of the very cold and chilling type of Englishwoman, more frequently met with two generations ago than in this age. She simply let her husband's first family alone. She took no interest in them, neglected them absolutely, but in her neglect, was far kinder and more humane than their own father. Yet she saw that all the money, all the pretty clothes, all the dainties went to her own children. Perhaps a reader will think these unpleasant characteristics of a harsh father and a self-centered stepmother might better be omitted from this narrative, particularly as death claimed these two many years ago. But... In the light of after events, it is necessary to reveal what the home environment of these children had been, how little of companionship or kindness or spoken love had entered their baby lives, the absence of mother kisses or father comradeship, of endeavor to understand them individually, to probe their separate and various dispositions, things so essential to the development of all that is best in a child, went far towards governing their later actions in life. It drove the unselfish sweetheart of Elizabeth to a loveless marriage. It flung poor little love-hungry Lydia into alien, but fortunately loyal and noble arms. Outsiders said, what strange marriages. But Lydia at least married where the first real kindness she had ever known called to her, and not one day of regret for that marriage ever entered into her life. It came about so strangely, so inevitably, from such a tiny source, tiny source, that it is almost incredible. Well, I'm going to stop reading there, and I'll find my page. I'll stop there at the point where the story of the Johnson family is just beginning to take root in its ideal setting at Chiefswood on the Six Nations Reserve in Ontario, Canada. I hope that you as a reader will follow up on it, as it's quite a fascinating story covering many levels of thought in the mind of the author Pauline Johnson. It's set in three countries, England, where her mother was born and which she left as a child, the United States, where her mother lived and then left as a young woman, and Canada, where her father was born and where her mother and father met, where they spent the rest of their lives, and is the land into which Pauline Johnson was born. Now I say into which, as each of us is born into a set of circumstances, an envelope by which we are shaped in terms of our limitations and our opportunities for growth, and which we shape in turn by minimizing our limitations and maximizing our advantages. For Pauline Johnson's mother and father, this envelope is the Canada of their time, 
the middle of the 19th century. And for Pauline and her sister and two brothers, it's the Canada of their time, the Canada of the 1890s, and the turn of the century into the 20th century. It's a story of the blending of two cultures, which had once been joined in the midst of time, but which had been separated now for millennia. Her mother is what Pauline Johnson refers to as English and white, and her father is what she refers to as red, Mohawk, and Indian. It's a story of harmony within the family, and both harmony and disharmony in society, as the family is involved in the turbulent social movements of the time. It's a story of everyday living in the part of Canada and Ontario in which I have lived for 40 plus years, just down the Grand River from Chiefswood, the home that Pauline Johnson's parents build and in which they live the happiest part of their lives until the death of George, the father of the family. It's a story which captures the everyday life of a family of that time and in that place and is fascinating on that account. It's a very skillful blending of the drama of a number of heightened moments of great tension and the lifelong arc of everyday affairs. It's a story of a great love, one which is fulfilling to both of the lovers, the parents of Pauline Johnson and her siblings, as only death can separate the two who have joined their lives together. It's a story of brutal violence as the whiskey traders whom Pauline's father opposes bring him down by beating him so severely that his injuries lead to his early death. Not lastly, but the last element of the story that I will mention is that it is a story of the effects of the passing of time in which a person, Pauline Johnson, explores the roots of her own journey through life, attempting to see as clearly as she can what it is that has made her what she has become. By the time she has the idea of writing this everyday story, this extraordinary story, and presenting it to the world. It's an attempt to examine the information of her early life and to turn it into imagery, the significant imagery that makes her think and feel the way she does so many years after these events have taken place. It's a fascinating story, one that will reward much more detailed attention than I have been able to give it in this short reading. So the two books are my novel, Pauline Johnson, Know Who I Am, and Pauline Johnson, Her Life and Work by Marcus Van Steen, a collection along with a short biography of her prose and poetry. Lastly, I'll just say thank you for watching this video.